really, there's like two or three spots where I think this one has an advantage uh, over the other versions of this uh, of this particular story. I think the T Rex fight is tremendous. Anyway, they do the T Rex fight. My favorite scene has to be the T Rex or what do they call it? Z Rex. Same with the V Rex, which is what they call the T Rex in this. It doesn't look right. Whatever kind of Rexes they are. Dude, that T-Rex fight was nuts. That that big fight, I mean, it's, oh my god. But this time, it's two T-Rexes, just like in Jurassic Park 2. And- just another thing that drives me crazy. T-Rex fight's way too long. Even when I was in middle school, I was in 7th or 8th grade when this came out, and I went to see it with my sisters, and even as a 13, 14-year-old boy, the prime audience for a T-Rex fight like that, when they fell into the pit and got caught by the vines, I was just like, okay. Uh, there's like the, the other scene, The it's the T-Rex, like, like trapeze act. Kong has to fight them off with a girl in his hands the whole time, like he's Jackie Chan doing one of those gimmicks where he's fighting in like a museum. And I thought they couldn't look any worse. And there's a shot or two of the T-Rexes that look just unbelievably bad. I mean, like Nintendo 64 on a budget bad. It's so shitty. They, they're like these little blobby turds. It just doesn't look right. Part of the thing is in actual nature, the Tyrannosaurus's eyes would have faced forward. This was an evolutionary trait that not a lot of other predatory theropod dinosaurs had. So now the eyes have separated again, like they're back on the sides of the head. So why would it have evolved that distinct disadvantage? But then, turns out, it's three T-Rexes, because now we're going even bigger than Jurassic Park 2. The the fact that he's fighting three of them, it's really cool, and the the way they fall off the cliffs and get stuck in the vines. So there's like three T-Rexes that are fighting against the lead actress and King Kong. And they get separated and she's having to swing back and forth. And there's a bit where a T-Rex is also caught in vines, like right in front of her. And they're kind of swinging towards each other and away from each other and just trying to snap her. It's really cool. So King Kong has to use a mix of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, professional wrestling moves, and other mixed martial arts abilities in order to kick three dinosaurs that, for some reason, seem way more interested in biting the tiny little white girl than they do fighting the actual giant monkey that's kicking them in the head. They they basically like jump off of a cliff to attack this woman. It's it's totally ridiculous. It's like they don't they don't care about their own lives. They're just like senseless killing machines. And it, I mean, that's fine. And all of this is pretty dumb. But like what makes the dinosaurs scary in Jurassic Park is that they're intelligent and they're conniving and they catch people off guard. There's like an element of, of sneakiness. With this, they are literally soaring through the sky back and forth on these vines, chomping at her from each side. They fall down through some vines. There's some like crystal skulls swinging around in the vine stuff. It's so well choreographed. It's so tense. It's almost comical. It's like not scary at all. And again, it goes on forever. Okay. All right. Let's, can we move along here? It's one of the few scenes on Skull Island where even though they're like in constant danger and there's all these set pieces where everyone's getting attacked and stuff, there's very few scenes where it feels like there are actual stakes. I really don't know how else to put it. And they they pay homage to the original. I love how they recreate so many cool visual moments from the original movie. Like Kong playing with the dead T-Rex's jaw. And um, eventually King Kong rips all the T-Rexes in half and bites their tongues. And we end with an epic monkey pose. And the fight ends cool, but it's because it ends the way the fight ends in the original version. (laughs) So, like I said, it's just... The movie would have been so much better if it were an hour and 40 minutes long instead of twice that. And I can go on and on about it all day, but, I mean, it, it's just a great... It's just something you gotta see. As it stands, the updated version of the T-Rex fight is a perfect analogy for this movie as a whole. It's almost twice as long as the original. Ends the exact same way, and you can't tell if you're actually feeling the intended emotions or just too tired from everything you just saw to think clearly. The one thing that's pretty disturbing in this movie is um, after the log scene where Kong shakes everybody off, which isn't as cool, but it's 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 not bad. Once everybody's the survivors are at the bottom of the ravine, uh, these bugs start swarming them. Oh, that scene with the bugs at the bottom of the ravine is so goddamn creepy. 
While this is going on, everyone else gets attacked by giant CGI penis leeches, and flying grasshoppers, cockroaches, and a giant crab claw. And then we get the most disgusting insect scene. Goes on for what? Over 10 slow ass minutes? And it gets cheesy because like dudes are shooting machine guns at each other from like five feet away and they are they're only hitting bugs. Which they punch and hit with machetes. I love how Peter Jackson showed the broken camera with the reel of film. It feels really meta because the original movie had that infamous spider scene that somehow went missing. And I feel like Jackson's like, yeah, you want the spider scene? I'll show you a spider scene. Shelob shows up. But if you don't like creepy crawly stuff, that scene will probably get to you because it's pretty disturbing. The worst creatures in this was the 40,000 spiders, locusts, and worm things in the pit. And this scene is like, Pretty gruesome and messed up. Uh, we made the mistake of half watching this part when we were in the middle of dinner. Ugh, my bad. And there's no music during this scene, which makes the whole thing even creepier as like these guys have the bugs and spiders and scorpions. It's all over the top, just like everything else in this movie. It's massively over the top. So talking about Andy Serkis, his his human character suffers one of the grossest deaths, I think maybe ever. The dude that gets like cacked by the penis leeches is a pretty horrific death movie death it's when they're in the ravine and charlie is dead and he's you know really attached to charlie because they like do stuff on the but like cook together or some crap who cares but these these like weird like fluke looking things show up and they start like these like pucker face teeth monsters show up and start trying to grab charlie's body so he's like punching and chopping at him and one by one like one grabs him by the leg and one's got him on the arm and another one gets him on the head and it's like it's not just it bites him on the head and he dies it like attaches itself to its head and then it starts like slowly going down further until finally it's all the way over his head and you can hear him screaming inside of it. We watch how every person died in excruciating detail. I mean, this was originally cut from 1933 for budget concerns, and it was nightmare-inducing. Oh, it's disturbing. It's really gross. But this scene is, like, very creepy and messed up and cool and dark and twisted and, and very, like, horror movie, like, you know, if you don't like things with more than four legs like it's gonna creep you out but it's also very very tonally weird in the middle of this movie like where did this come from you know there's some cool effects there's some cool death stuff there's some cool action stuff but we've seen like some violence and some fighting and some killing and some guys get trampled by giant cartoon dinosaurs but like the dude that gets like his head like graphically like removed by a penis leech like that's hardcore. My other complaint about this movie, besides the length, is that the island still doesn't make sense. Everything on the island is a carnivore, with the exception of what? Some brontosauruses? All the insects are four feet long and eat people. The bats are like gargoyles. They're dinosaurs. What, what does everything eat to stay alive? How do they get so big? You can't have carnivore island if you don't have prey. Really, the only thing that's awesome about Skull Island is just the, the look of it, the production value. Like The set design is just unreal. It's so cool. I'm into it, but it's really a weird interlude. It's so, so cool. The quiet parts of this movie are absolutely stunning. The connection she gets with Kong, she understands him. They grow to, to respect one another. That moment with Anne and Kong on the cliff, looking out at the sunset is awesome. Conversely, the scenes where where Anne and Kong are like alone, the CG is incredible. It looks so good. Uh, the scenes where Kong is fighting the T-Rexes, which are also pretty derpy, uh, it looks fantastic. I don't know. It, it was weird. It, it was, it, at least she did something. Like there was some agency involved. It wasn't just that like monkey-like pretty girl. It was her vaudeville act, I guess, that the monkey liked. There's a love there. I know it's, it's at least more from Kong's side. Naomi Watts was gorgeous, but her priorities are skewed. But... It still didn't feel great to me. It still feels like a weird Stockholm Syndrome thing that this movie's presenting, where, like, the girl falls in love with King Kong, even though King Kong, like, murders a lot of people. But I also think that Andero, in this version, does love Kong in a way. And that's something missing from the original. There's sympathy there. I think it's Stockholm Syndrome, because about ten minutes before she's trying to cheer out Kong, she's being treated like one of those kids in the PSA about shaking babies. Does Naomi Watts want to f*** the monkey... Um, yeah, it was weird. You know, the problem with them remaking it the way that they did uh, and, and keeping, for the most part at least, so close to the original story is that 
you've kind of seen all this before. Yeah, it looks different. It's got like a snazzier packaging on it or whatever, but it, it's so, it's not enough new or different to really distract from the fact that you're see, you've already seen this movie. And it is so inconsistent in its pacing, tone, and editing that it, it's just, uh, it's hard to ever really connect to the film. You know, it'll pick up momentum in, in some scenes where you're like, oh, this is really cool, or oh, I really like this part, and then it slows way back down again. Though I do think it's funny he went out through all that, killed his cameraman, his sound guy, and still ended up breaking the camera. Man, Jack Black is such a douche. I just, I think one of the best moments of the movie is where Anne just walks past him and he's so obsessed, he doesn't even see her. So, I have questions. How did they get Kong on the boat and back to New York and then past customs? Just like in the original, we cut straight to Broadway in Times Square. Another instance in the original, when Kong is, is breaking free, uh, Jack and Ann are like kind of right there in the vicinity, so it doesn't take Kong long to find her. In this one, because she wants nothing to do with the, you know, uh, Denim and his gang after they took Kong from the island, she's often like some crappy little small production where she's dancing. Um, it, it shows Jack like away. He's feeling bummed out that he's not with her, and he, you know, I don't know. It, it keeps taking the momentum and just throwing it on the floor smashing it to pieces and then coming back up like let's build it all back up again and so it just feels very 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 disjointed and inconsistent with a few peak really high peak moments back in new york i do like the stage show that we see here for king kong a little more than what we saw in the original movie because i understand what the show looks like a little bit more they bring out like some sets kong the eighth wonder of the world this is such an impressive recreation of the original. They're, they're recreating the story of their adventure on the island as a play with Kong just chained up in the background, I guess. And I'm like, okay, that's a little bit more of a show. Because in the first one, I'm like, what is the show? Like, you're just like, big monkey. And the crowd goes, ooh, big monkey. And then you go, mm-hmm. An adventure in which 17 of our parties suffered terrible deaths. I like how Jack Black's denim quotes the Arabian proverb from the opening of the original. Big monkey? And the crowd goes, yes, yes, big monkey. And then you go, yeah, mm-hmm. And, uh, like, I don't understand how... Like, how long do you keep those people in the audience for the original movie's version of what the show is? Where in this one, I'm like, okay, you're telling a plot. So, like, you know, when the plot's done, then the show's over and everybody goes home. That moment where Kong breaks the chains is truly terrifying. So Kong goes on a rampage, like that giant gorilla in the video game Rampage. He's wrecking cars and chucking blonde chicks all over New York City. Kong escapes from the theater, and every blonde woman everywhere is totally screwed right now. After Kong escapes and demolishes the Alhambra theater and kills half the audience, eating a couple dudes, and he is frantically looking for Ant. When Kong is in New York, all of that, with a few questionable shots, uh, looks great. Man, it really feels like Kong should have killed Jack Black in this version. Kong's uh, breakout and rampage through New York City was oh, was fine. I, I think it was pretty cool. An example of it slowing down and in, in the, the the inconsistency in the pacing is in when Kong has uh, broken free of his restraints in New York and he's running around and he's chasing after a Adrian Brody's character. Everything happens to him. He doesn't do anything on his own. I realize he's supposed to be our conscience, but I wasn't buying it. And, and Jack's trying to get away from him in a cab. And it's really, really cool. Like, from the moment Kong sees Jack in the theater when he's escaping and he, and he smells him and recognizes him as the guy that took Anne, from that moment until Jack's trying to get away in the cab and Kong just smashes the shit out. He just bops it and it does like a backflip and uh, knocks Jack out. From, from that to that, it's incredible action. It's terrific. There's, like a couple scenes that are okay and in a movie that that sucks they're amazing i think the fact that it's winter was a nice touch too the fact that she doesn't show up at the show at the end that was that was a brilliant bold change because it cha it changes the entire dynamic of their relationship she respects kong she wants to protect kong where no one else really did. He was just an asset. He was just a thing. But here, that's where that sympathy grows. And I love that version of this character. And the fact, that's that's the crux of the whole thing for me. 
This poor little guy, he's he's very cold and very scared, and he does not recognize this jungle. And then, for some reason, as soon as Kong smacks Jack's car and walks out of, like, nowhere, the city is suddenly completely empty. There's nobody there at all. I mean, two blocks ago, pandemonium. Now it's nothing. And eventually, of course, Anne comes to him, knowing that she's the only one that can calm him down. And she very slowly walks up, and then she and Kong spend about, I don't know, 48 minutes staring at each other. And the shot of her walking through the middle of the deserted street is pretty awesome. Just staring at each other. But her outfit makes zero sense. It looks really cold. Um, the stuff... When Anne and Kong are in New York together, is just ridiculous. Oh, and the scene at the end where she's ice skating and Kong was ridiculous. And then he picks her up, like, here we go again, and they go wandering off. And then, like, two blocks later, it's back to, like, oh, shit, gunfire. And it's just, it's it, it keeps navel-gazing. It again had a weird cutaway in the middle of it where Kong goes ice skating while he's holding on to the girl. Anybody who doesn't get a chuckle, at least, from the scene where he's sliding around on the ice and goofing around or the scenes where they're joke they're kind of making each other laugh a little bit, like you're heartless. That that's hilarious and it's it's heartwarming and it's great. He eventually finds Anne and they go ice skating in Central Park. And does Naomi Watts wanna the monkey? I mean, I guess he's the least shitty male character in this movie from the primate order, but this part's weird. Which is just, I don't know. <sighs> the ice skating. I try not to curse on my show, but I... <sighs> I, don't, I don't get the romance plot in King Kong. It just doesn't make sense to me. The ice skating. Ugh. And um, luckily it's short-lived before they start launching grenades at Kong. Um, but the rest of the rampage was pretty good. Kong smashing through 30s New York is pretty awesome. A moment that made me laugh was when the grizzled old guy was giving orders to his soldiers that, This is New York! This is sacred ground! And like two seconds later, the whole carrier he's in gets booted into a wall. So King Kong climbs the Empire State Building. And obviously the, the final scene on uh, top of the uh, Empire State Building. What I do think is interesting about it is King Kong broke out during the show, which is presumably in the evening, and by the end of his rampage, it's morning. And we see uh, the sunrise over New York uh, for the Empire State Building, and it's just such a gorgeous shot. So was King Kong on a rampage for like 12 hours? Uh, it's just so long. Because it, it seemed like the movie was presenting everything in more or less real time at that point. <sighs> Like, like King Kong's Rampage was probably about 20 minutes, but apparently it was 12 hours that he was just running amok through New York City. And he has a sweet moment with Anne when he signs Beautiful back to her like she did to him in the jungle. That part is pretty sweet and nice and a uh, tearjerker, and I like it. I really appreciate how Anne Darrow isn't just a damsel in distress in this version. This whole climax is pretty dramatic. They did a fabulous job of that. Very emotional gut-wrenching scene. And even though I love, like, the emotional stakes here and I like how they've developed these characters, I still feel like, like, Anne, what are you doing? You're gonna get killed. <laughs> Her motivations at the very end here are a little bit questionable. Kong and Anne bond in that moment uh, where he, the, the pounding of the chest moment, like, he, he, he had understood what she'd said, beautiful, that that it always kind of makes me well up a little bit because I, I think it's such a, a great character building moment for both of them. Still, it makes for an awesome sequence. Climb to the top and a bunch of airplanes from the World War One style biplanes cack him. To me, the best thing about the film is Kong and his personality being able to like kind of come through. Like he feels like a real character rather than just like a big you know killing machine. In fact, I would go so far as to say he feels more well rounded than the human characters do for the most part. But. I just can't help thinking, like, this is a good ending. This is, like, you know, a tearjerker kind of bit. Like, it's nice. I like when he gets shot and he falls off the, the Empire State Building and it's quiet. All of this part is good. But, man, it took us a long time to get here. Three and a half hours is a long-ass movie. And by this point, uh, I, I imagine we'll have a lot of people on here saying, like, they love this part. But, like, man, I was just happy that we were finally getting to the end of this thing. And at the end, of course, Jack Black, as Carl Denham says, "'Twas beauty killed the beast." No, no, it was you, you jackass. You killed the beast. Pretty sure he's liable for, uh, like, all that damage. And definitely guilty of manslaughter. 
I don't know how they managed to do it, but this Beauty Kill the Beast line is somehow delivered worse this time around. Like, it doesn't fit, it doesn't make any sense. Why is this here? The screen just cuts and, like, nothing. And then it turns out that we were the real monsters all along. So get used to that theme. It's going to come up again as in more than one of these films as we cover the giant monster series. I was really hoping that the movie would end with him, like, getting carted off by the police as he said that line. But, you know, at least he had kind of a haunted look in his, in his expression. Okay, so that's King Kong. You know, I don't know. I thought I'd have a lot more to say about this movie. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have much else to say. Um, I'd say the one thing that I don't like about the film, and to, to even say that it's uh, putting it mild, like, I don't hate it, but it is a little bit too long. I think I've seen this movie once before, and after watching it this time, I will never watch it again. It's so damn long. I honestly kind of forgot it existed until we were going to do it for the show here. So maybe that's kind of summarizes how I feel about it is I, I kind of forgot it existed. It, it's un, it's inoffensive. It's not bad. It's just bloated. So when I talked to Ben about recording this bit, I said I didn't think I could actually get my blood boiling again the way that I did that night at D&D. But I, I think <laughs> I feel like I got pretty close. And so many things that bother me. Uh, the... <clears throat> I, and this is a movie I like, <laughs> for the most part. It's way too fat. It needed to cut at minimum 40 minutes out of the runtime. And I think it would be wallow a lot better. There's so many things that bother me, though. Um, when, when there's... All in all, I thought this was a really fantastic film. The King Kong is not a good movie. I like that it was a remake that really stayed true to the original movie. I'd say if there was a definitive version of King Kong that you wanted to show someone, this would be it. But it developed it. It developed the characters a lot more. This movie was a remake of the original that did a couple things differently. It it made Anne a little bit more of a developed character. It made Denim a little bit more of a developed character. I never did and kind of surprisingly don't hate Jack Black in this role. I think he does a pretty acceptable job. The only thing I don't like are his Jack Blackisms, uh, especially in the beginning when he says something about learning how to outcrap the crappers. Like, no one in the 1930s would say that. That is just you, Jack Black. It won four Academy Awards, most of them for audiovisual stuff, which I've commented on a little bit snarkily during the course of this, but, like, I really don't have a ton of reference. Like, I can't, like, instantly recall what 2005-inch CGI looked like, so I'm, I'm comparing it against Jurassic Park, which was a lot of practical effects as well, so maybe I'm not being kind to the CG. It looks rough. I was watching it on a laptop, uh, so maybe it wasn't, like, the, the experience you were supposed to have with it. You know, I remember it being pretty successful. You know, it didn't set the world on fire. It wasn't, like, something culturally that people talked about a lot, but it, it did well, and it, if I remember correctly for the most part, got pretty positive reviews from people, both critics and audiences. Despite its massive budget, this movie made about as much money as Madagascar and less than the Tom Cruise War of the Worlds. I bring that up because I was going to say that this movie is like kind of hilariously terrible, but then again, Revenge of the Sith also made more money than it in 2005, so uh, maybe that doesn't track. In case you're wondering, Pirates 4 is the most expensive movie ever made as of the recording of this episode, and that is the second worst of the Pirates movies. So apparently this movie had a well-received video game on the 360 and eventually, you know, PC and all the other stuff that lets you play as Jack and as Kong. And it was well-rated. I mean, people enjoyed the hell out of it. Troy, you should do one that one next. So, you know, in in some ways it's the antithesis of the 98 Godzilla. In other ways it's similar, you know, it overlies on some kind of crappy human characters rather than doing justice to the, uh, the monster at times. But unlike Godzilla, when they do focus on the monster, and it's quite interesting. It turned Jack into a writer instead of having him be the guy on the boat. Like, the guy on the boat was still there, but he was a, more of a brute, and Jack was there to be the, the sensitive guy, but also the action hero. 
We also don't really know about a lot of these characters. Uh, I kind of realized I felt very disconnected. Like it, it felt like I was watching a popcorn flick, not like an actual creative film, but they're just people. There are no real characters and there's also no real development, except maybe Denim and Darrow, but pretty much everyone else just sort of does whatever they need to do at the moment. Baxter randomly has a hero moment, even though we've established that he's kind of a piece of shit. Uh, we literally know nothing about the romantic interest Driscoll, but he's shown to be kind of weak and pathetic. And then he's the hero going out of his way to do all of these amazing feats. But yeah, just whenever something is needed, they throw someone into that role and it's like, okay, whatever. When there is the stuff with Jack and Anne falling in love, I think it's worse than in the original. The original one's not great the way they handle that, but it's kind of believable for the time. Here, like, they just start making out after he writes her a script. And the part that's the worst about it is she's like, I don't understand why you wrote this for me. And he's like, it's in the subtext. Uh, that's way too low with a voice for an Adrian Brody impression. It's in the subtext. Uh, I, I can't do it. Anyway, there's no subtext to this movie. There's none. <laughs> like, none. So, I don't know, man. Peter Jackson is usually, I guess this is maybe a bit more Hobbit Peter Jackson than Lord of the Rings Peter Jackson. Who knows? Again, I actually do like this movie pretty well. It's just very frustrating. I'm very curious to see exactly how much control Peter Jackson had over the final cut of this film because it's, it's, a, it's really all over the place. So many people who get to a point where they have proven themselves creatively and so they no longer are questioned by the people who would normally restrain them see George Lucas, see Stephen King, see Peter Jackson. I mean, this is his follow-up to The Lord of the Rings, which were great movies, but he was fighting the studio every step of the way to get those movies out. And he had pretty much free reign on this, and it shows, and it's not a good thing. <laughs> Art comes through adversity, and he didn't... I mean, he did face adversity making this film. He didn't lose all that weight. That was a myth. He was consciously trying to lose weight while working on this film. He did lose the weight, but it wasn't because of the stress of the film. Uh, maybe once he got all the money and success and fame from Lord of the Rings, his, his fire kind of burned out a little bit. I don't know. It's hard for me to say. I don't really have any insight into Peter Jackson's brain yet. But I don't know. When it's all said and done, I, I, I like this movie well enough... I didn't love it the way that I, I love the 33 Kong. I, again, maybe because it's not really setting the bar higher for anything. Like, the, the old Kong pushed all the limits of filmmaking. This one, just, like, it's it's fine. I don't think there was anything particularly wrong with the story or the characters or the the combat or the, the acting, the direction, the cinematography. All that stuff was fine. It was well done. It was a very faithful adaptation and remake of the original 1933 King Kong, except it was more than twice the length and, uh, like, what, 4x the budget, and it just, it feels like it, man. It's long, and it just seems like everything is, is over the top, right? It looks beautiful. The production value is great. Like the city, the, the time period stuff is tremendously well done. And then, the, of course, all the Kong fights are great. But other than that, like they spend way too much time everywhere. So a couple of points of critique. I love all of the interactive stuff between Hayes and Jimmy. Another thing that really bugs me with this lack of subtlety is Jimmy. I hate Jimmy so much. I loathe the placement. It is the worst placement. Every single time they do it, it feels forced and unnatural. There's a special place in hell for Jimmy. And it's like, you're ruining these perfectly good moments right now. And then you had a whole subplot where there's a young guy in the boat who was like found by one of the shipmates who then brought him up. I, I don't care, man. And one of them literally like Hayes just looks off into the distance and randomly starts talking about where he found Jimmy. And it's like, dude, calm down. I'm an author just writing a book. I don't need this kid's life story. I hate Jimmy so much, and he's reading Heart of Darkness, and when they crash into the rocks on Skull Island and the crew goes ashore, Jimmy is talking with Mr. Hayes, the first mate, about Heart of Darkness. It's not an adventure story, is it? No, Jimmy. No, it's not. And then all of a sudden, Mr. Hayes just goes into like this monologue from the book about 
the point of the movie. There's no subtext to this movie. There's none. It's like that uh, from, from Futurama where Fry trades hands with the robot devil and writes an opera, and the robot devil criticizes the writing by saying that you can't just have your characters say how they feel. That makes me feel angry. Uh, <laughs> this movie, that's one of the very worst things that it does. There's no subtlety. <sighs> I'm here to see Big Monkey. It just, that, that's, that kind of stuff just didn't do it for me. Anyway, I've rambled long enough. It's a good movie. It's just dumb and bad. It does everything. <sighs> uh, it's just so long. My only major complaint is that it's a very long movie. I feel like you could probably trim some of this. I, I do respect the character building, and I, I feel like everything with Anne needs to stay intact. But, um... Anyway, I thought this was, like, really, really, really long. This was a really long movie. But there are some elements, some sequences you probably could have cut back on. And even knowing that there's an extended version of this film out there boggles my mind. I watched the extended cut. I want to say it was just about four hours. It's such a stupidly long movie. Everything is just dragged oh it's it's like oh i gotta give this room to breathe and i gave this room to breathe and i gotta get this room to breathe i mean i'm all for more kong but this just seems a little excessive everything is drawn way out every scene is like oh we gotta give this some more room to breathe here and so you end up with scenes that should be 30 40 seconds long going on for four and a half minutes and it happens all the time and i know peter jackson seems to have uh, a history of doing this but uh, I've never watched the extended version. I don't know if I ever will because I kind of feel like the, the theatrical version was long enough. And I don't know. I feel like maybe if this wasn't such a direct remake of the original movie, then those other plots might have interested me more. But because it was in so many ways such a remake, I'm like, I know that this isn't going to be that important. Like the movie's going to forget about this plot at some point. And it did. Like when you get back to New York, that that stuff doesn't show up anymore. Like, once you get back to New York, it's pretty much just the same movie again, except with Big Monkey Go Ice Skating in the middle. And it's not a bad thing, but sometimes I want to... I've watched it less than the others because of its length. And even though I find it to be vastly superior in a lot of ways, its length really does hinder me from watching it as much as i like to because I know it's going to be a long haul. But I feel like they could have easily split this into two movies, into two parts. And it might have been better for it, you know? But, um, yeah, I just, I will never watch that movie ever again. It's, it's, it's too much. Like many Peter Jackson films, my biggest problem with this is that it's approximately three days long. I feel like this does the job, even though in a very lengthy way, it tells the story that needs to be told the right way with a lot of heart and depth and character development. But I understand that it can be a bit of a commitment at three hours. But it is an epic movie epic movies are supposed to be long but it's well made it looks good at times great uh and they did justice to the big guy and i really at the end of the day as long as your kong himself is cool i think another thing worth noting is that there was actually another king kong remake back in 1976 with jeff bridges and with that one they actually tried to modernize it and update it well for the time for the 70s instead of Kong climbing the Empire State Building, it was the Twin Towers. And, and we're going to talk about some of the other maybe um, not so great ones in a future episode. When, you, when you've seen like the 70s Kong and Kong lives and all that stuff, um, this is, you know, uh, this is chef's kiss. Thankful, uh, I personally like some of the, the you know, um, kind of crappy dude in a suit Kong movies are a lot of fun. Uh I don't know if I like them more than I like this one, but we'll talk about some of those. Uh, we'll talk about some of the goofy Japanese stuff, the soup nation. Uh, I don't remember who it was said on the last episode. I like that. I know I seem to have come down pretty hard on this film, but come on, guys. There's 72 years and a bad 70s remake between this movie and the original. Sure, they steered clear of Dino De Laurentiis' mistakes, but they made a whole bunch of new ones. The truth of the matter is this movie would have been a lot better if it had been an hour and 40 minutes long. But what's interesting to me is that in the original 1933 film, they brought Kong to life with stop motion animation. And then in the 76 version, they attempted to use animatronics. Like there was a giant mechanical Kong that they created for the movie. Unfortunately, 
apparently the robot Kong didn't work very well, so they ended up actually using a guy in a suit, like the Toho Godzilla movies. And then, of course, the advances in CG and motion capture. For this version, they used motion capture and computer graphics. And of course, uh, an excellent performance by Andy Serkis. In the same way that, that Peter Jackson and Andy Serkis brought Golem to life, they applied those same techniques to King Kong. And I'm pretty sure this is the first movie where the title character was uh, acted out with motion capture technology, which of course paved the way f for the newer uh, Planet of the Apes films, you know, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, War for the Planet of the Apes. Also, uh, oddly enough, played by Andy Serkis. And speaking of Andy Serkis, he actually did the motion capture for Godzilla in the next one on our list. So this this guy is all over the place these days. Peter Jackson stripped away all the nuance from the original movie. And again, this is a movie I mostly like. I just It's all stripped away, like the most blundering, obvious way to make every point that the movie original movie makes with so much subtlety and i think that's the real problem is that you have the original to compare it to i think one reason this movie was so well received initially is because people have the 70s dino de laurentis version in mind which is so bad so this is a big step up from that but it's a huge step down from the original in my opinion but i think it's really cool if, if you look at the progression of uh king kong movies you can really see an evolution of technology in film and i feel like this is the the superior version out of the three versions that are out there first or, the original king kong classic masterpiece surprisingly subtle for a movie about a giant monkey second king kong from the 70s dumb and bad does everything wrong Third King Kong, 2005, Peter Jackson. It would be better if it were shorter and less self-indulgent, but it's still pretty good. I didn't love this one. It looked good, but I, I don't feel like it was necessary because I think the original movie still looked pretty cool. I mean, obviously Kong looks better in this than he does in the original, but I, it just, I, it, it added a lot more action. It added a lot more monsters and those were all fine. I think if I had never seen the original and I saw this, I'd be like, oh, that was pretty good. But having seen the original, I'm like, ah, you know, yeah, yeah, it was fine. It would be kind of interesting to see a remake of the classic King Kong modernized, but I feel like it has a lot more weight with the fact that they, you know, set it in the 30s. Like, if you're going to make the quintessential King Kong movie, I mean, you kind of have to set it in the 30s, right? That said, I absolutely love what the new movies have done with Kong. Kong Skull Island, however, is amazing, and I've watched that four or five times. But that one's on the list, and we'll get to that soon enough. You know, I, I, uh, it's hard to say. This one's somewhere in the middle for me. I, I like it. I don't love it, I don't like it, but I don't hate it. I mean, the best analogy is that this is, this movie is to the 1933 King Kong, what the Hobbit trilogy of movies is to the 100 page little novella that J.R.R. Tolkien wrote as a bedtime story for his son. Yeah, it's the Hobbit. You know what I mean? It's it's inoffensive and it's kind of easily forgettable. I love kaiju movies. I love, uh, you know, big monsters. So this doesn't come from a place of, of ignorance. I've watched a lot of these movies, and King Kong is just, it's just awful. It's fine. For my thoughts on other big monkey movies, including the original and still the best King Kong, check out Record All Monsters. New episodes every other Friday, and usually a special little something in between. Until next time, remember that monsters are your friends. And who would win Kong Godzilla? Okay, so the one missed opportunity we have with this, this this particular version of Kong is that we didn't get a chance to see him fight the uh, the the ninety eight Godzilla. I, apparently, I've not really understood the rules over the last ep few episodes. So this King Kong versus uh, what Godzilla? I don't know. I mean, who would win in a fight between Peter Jackson's King Kong and the 1998 Americanized Zilla? So this Kong is a very weak monkey. If for no other reason, then this Kong would annihilate that Godzilla. This doesn't tip the scales for me in terms of who would win because this King Kong doesn't seem any more capable than the King Kong of the 1933's King Kong. You know, for this one, I, I gotta hand this one to Kong. He would beat the living 
out of him and it would be so much fun to watch because that Godzilla I know this was last episode but he sucks now for both of these redesigns they actually tried to make them both a little bit more realistic Kong looks and acts like a gorilla and they actually depowered this Godzilla significantly even though they gave him a speed advantage over the original Godzilla you guys he sucks sure he's big and strong and he beats some ass in the movie, but he was super mortal and tiny. But in comparing the two when they faced off against the military, Kong was a lot tougher. And even though the 1930s troops were way more competent than the ones in the 90s Godzilla, Kong held his own. And Godzilla was ultimately taken out by some of the worst soldiers I've ever seen in any movie. Any version of Godzilla will still kick King Kong's ass. Of course he's not going to win. I mean, he's only 20 feet tall versus the, the 80 meter tall Godzilla or whatever height he's he's running at these days. There's just not a chance in hell that, that Kong ever wins this battle. Uh, any version of Godzilla is going to whoop his ass. I mean, it's it's a little unfair because he's so small, but when you put them side by side, yeah, Kong Kong's going to come out on top. So yeah, it would probably be a tough fight, but I think ultimately King Kong would destroy this Godzilla. And he's essentially a crappy looking T-Rex. And if there's one thing we learned from this movie, this Kong is really, really good at beating the ever loving out of crappy, derpy, low grade looking T-Rexes. Sure, this Godzilla is still bigger, but Kong's, Kong's quick. You know, he could definitely climb up his back and I could definitely see him pulling uh, one of those T-Rex moves where he just rips his jaw open. Kong's going to come out on top. Maybe. Possibly. I mean, yeah, of course he is. Come on. You know he's going to win. Man, I kind of want to see that movie now. All right. Thanks so much as always, guys. And we will see you on the next one. King Kong will return in Kong Skull Island. And Godzilla will return in 2014's Godzilla. And next up, we're finally getting to the legendary films starting with 2014's Godzilla. I want to talk to somebody in charge. You are not fooling anybody when you say that what happened was a natural disaster. You're lying. It was not an earthquake. It wasn't a typhoon. Because what's really happening is that you're hiding something out there. And it is going to send us back to the Stone Age. In 1954, we awakened something. Well, there's nuclear tests in the Pacific. Not tests. They are trying to kill it. You have no idea what's coming. Can you kill it? The arrogance of man is thinking nature is in our control. And not the other way around.
Podcast as a Symbol is a production of the We Can Make This Work Probably Podcast Network. Find more of our shows at probablywork.com and learn how to contribute to future episodes of Podcast as a Symbol by looking us up on Twitter and Instagram at Cast as a Symbol or joining our Discord. The link is in the show notes. Submissions are always open. Thank you to everyone who's able to contribute to this episode. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to where you can find them all online. Thank you. Oh God, please, thank you. Music produced by Deft Stroke Sound. Opening narration written by Eric Slater and performed by Justin Aki. This episode was edited by Eric Slater. This has been a presentation of the We Can Make This Work Probably Network. Follow us on Twitter at Probably Work for more of our questionable content. Also, we have a website called ProbablyWork.com. I love the visuals with the fire and drum music and, uh, uh, never mind. So, like I said, it's just, the movie would have been so much better if it were 40 minutes long. Or an hour and 40 minutes long. By Velociraptors and Velociraptors. Y'all, these rappers. (laughs) God damn it. Adrian Brody as screenwriter Jack. Adrian Brody. Adrian Brody as screenwriter Jack Driscoll. So now we find ourselves engaging in the time-honored tradition of the pros and cons list. That's what makes the world go round. You know. For every con, there is a pro. Each thing that rocks has one that blows, and that's what makes a movie a mixed bag at best. There's so many things that bother me. Uh, the, the <clears throat> and anybody who doesn't at least get a chuckle out of the scene where he's sliding around on the ice with uh, with Naomi is is really cool. Uh, but uh, let me rephrase that: the ice skating, uh, and just. Ev- Ah! Hey, f- you. <laughs> Podcasters assemble.